Defence Dialogue, a podcast discussing contemporary challenges in the area of European security and defence. Brought to you by the Martin Centre with Nicholas Novaki. Hello, everyone, and um, welcome to uh, another episode of the Martin Centre's um, Defence Dialogue podcast. My name, as usual, is um, Dr. Niklas Novaki. I'm a research officer here at the Wilfrid Martin Center for European Studies, or like literally here in the cyberspace these days, because we're recording this uh, remotely. Um, and with me in this um, cyberspace space is uh, my dear colleague, Alvaro de la Cruz from the communications um, team. He's our communications and uh, media officer. Welcome again, Alvaro, and like very happy that uh, you can uh, join uh, another one of these uh, recordings. Thank you, Nicholas. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. This time I can I can happily say from uh, sunny Brussels. Indeed, indeed, it is a bit sunny. So, like, we're recording this episode on a Friday. So, like, I mean, hopefully, like, the sun will continue over the weekend as well. In today's episode, I wanted to focus on the very much discussed topic of uh, vaccine diplomacy, um, which. Um, refers to the exchange or potential exchange of uh, corona vaccines for political influence and what this means uh, for the European Union. Since the beginning of the pandemic, um, many countries and actors like the EU like, have been forced to step up their efforts to protect their citizens and economies, as well as those of their partner countries like from the pandemic. And the fight against the pandemic has also created opportunities uh, for countries to increase their influence and international uh, prestige um, in retrospect, perhaps rather unsurprisingly. And this applies not just to the European Union, its partners uh, and allies, but also to the EU's rivals. And China and Russia in particular have used the provision of medical supplies to boost their image and political influence uh, throughout the pandemic. And we, we, we probably like remember um, these um, images uh, from uh, spring uh, 2020 when the pandemic was uh, just the beginning of like Russia providing very visibly uh, assistance uh, to EU member states such as Italy, like when there were shortages of uh, masks and, and, and uh, ventilators. And um, at the time, these activities were referred in the media as uh, mask uh, diplomacy. But now, uh, both China and Russia are also using the corona vaccines uh, that they have developed to boost their uh, in influence or soft power. And um, as more kind of richer parts of the world, such as Europe and the US, have grabbed uh, alliance a share of the authorized vaccines produced by uh, Western companies. Um, low to middle income countries in the world, uh, especially like have uh, had to turn to Russia and China for vaccines. So at the moment, it looks like around 20 countries are using or intending to use the uh, various uh, Chinese vaccines um, at, at the time, like when we're uh, recording this episode. Uh, with regard to Russia's uh, Sputnik V vaccine, it looks like around 22 countries are uh, using or intending to, to use it. And, and uh, Sputnik V got recently a big boost because um, it was declared uh, safe and effective um, in, by the uh, well-known British peer-reviewed medical journal, the, the Lancet, um, which, which, which the Russians and, and um, they, they were obviously like very pleased and, and the developers of Sputnik V. So those countries like using the Russian and Chinese, vac Chinese vaccines at the moment in include um, countries from the EU's neighborhood, such as uh, Turkey, Ukraine, Azerbaijan, Egypt, Algeria, and Morocco. Notably, only one EU member state, uh, Hungary, has uh, signed contracts for, for both the Russian and the Chinese vaccines, um, in addition to the contracts that it has signed um, uh, for, for the Western vaccines. And uh, so far, Hungary has ordered 2 million Russian vaccines and 5 million uh, Chinese ones. And it's important to note that neither the, neither the Russian nor any of the Chinese vaccines have yet been approved by the European Medicines Agency. The EMA has so far recommended the approval of the US company uh, Moderna's vaccine, uh, the one by the British Swedish company AstraZeneca, and uh, also the Pfizer BioNTech uh, Comirnaty uh, vaccine. I'm sorry, that was a horrible pronunciation. Um, and um, although 
Western authorities, such as the EMA, haven't yet approved the Chinese and Russian vaccines, the global urgency to deal with the pandemic has created a strong international uh, demand for them because countries obviously like have a very strong need to uh, vaccinate their people. And importantly, the Chinese and Russian, uh, Russian efforts to distribute um, uh, these vaccines that they have created also contrast quite, quite heavily with the uh, rather slow uh, multilateral efforts uh, that we've seen at the global level so far. So uh, the WHO's, uh, the World Health, also, World Health Organization's Vaccine Procurement Initiative, uh, COVAX, uh, for which the EU is the biggest uh, donor, has hardly began to deliver uh, shots to poor nations. And uh, rather recently, like French President Macron, for example, like called this a little bit humiliating. And um, the Russian and Chinese efforts also contrast with the EU's own problems, especially when it comes to vaccine procurement. Um, the Commission um, had to recently apologize for failings of the European wide uh, vaccine procurement scheme, and um, which followed uh, a few weeks of a battle uh, over the vaccine, like during which the Commission uh, was bl uh, the Commission blamed uh, the, the company AstraZeneca for uh, failing to hold up to the commitments uh, that it agreed to in its contract with the European Union. So. Using international aid assistance uh, to increase one's influence is, is, is a very old uh, strategy uh, for country. Uh, examples of it, even in uh, Thucydides' uh, history of the Peloponnesian War. And uh, basically, uh, at the moment, Beijing is uh, trying to counter, like through vaccine diplomacy, the allegations that it's uh, covered up the early spread of uh, the coronavirus. Um, it's also, um, there have also been reports that it's linking its vaccine efforts uh, to the prospect of future investment and um, as a, a lender to poorer nations, um, to sovereign debt cancellations. Um, and it may also leverage, uh, it, has, it has been argued, the added goodwill when allies are needed on issues such as uh, territorial disputes in the uh, South China Sea. For Russia, the vaccine diplomacy is a way to boost its global standing uh, at a time when its relations with the EU and the US have hit uh, another rock bottom uh, due to the jailing of opposition leader Alexei Navalny. Um, and in addition, it provides Moscow with the additional benefit of creating internal tensions and divisions like within the European Union, because there are obviously like many, many people also within the European Union, which would rather have uh, the Russian vaccine, like if the option is uh, to wait much longer for, for, for other vaccines. So um, perhaps, I mean, just to, um, just to kind of briefly uh, discuss also like the EU dimension, the EU is basically like trying to fight back at the moment against um, China's and Russia's vaccine diplomacy by emphasizing uh, its own contributions uh, to the global effort the commission and the high representative recently published a new multilateralism strategy which among other things emphasize that the EU has led international solidarity and cooperation efforts by uh, gathering world leaders and civil society around the world uh, to a pledging event uh, to boost funding for research and the distribution of, of uh, corona vaccines, uh, diagnostics and, uh, therapy and uh, diagnostics and therapeutics. And uh, the strategy also noted that the EU is working with the um, uh, G20 groups, ACTA Accelerator, and the WHO's COVAX um, vaccine seems to ensure that the development, production, and delivery of safe uh, corona vaccines is ramped up and will help its partners. So, but yet the perception remains that the EU hasn't done enough to ensure an equitable delivery of vaccines around the world. And this perception is hard to shake off and, and uh, Russia and China are obviously happy to uh, take advantage of this perception uh, around the world. So as a result of this, I think European leaders, the EU itself like has woken up more and more to the need to, to counter uh, the vaccine diplomacy of, of um, China and Russia. And French President Macron, for example, proposed recently that the, that the European Union and the US should allocate 5% of their current uh, corona vaccines to developing countries where vaccination efforts have hardly taken off. And um, Macron also mentioned that he had discussed this idea with uh, German Chancellor Angela Merkel, who apparently like supports this initiative, 
but importantly, like the US at the moment uh, doesn't. So we're still trying, trying to kind of figure out like what would be the best way uh, for the EU to counter the vaccine diplomacy of uh, other countries. Okay, um, thank you, Niklas, uh, for the introduction. Um, I wanted to ask you first, uh, there's no doubt that uh, the vaccination European strategy is uh, key in European security. There's nothing more important for our security than to secure a healthy population and to be able to focus in strategic uh, uh, issues for the European um, uh, Union, uh, regardless of uh, the, if they're um, related to security and defense or not. So, uh, of course, there's there's a soft power com component in, in this uh, strategy, but also um, a kind of strong power one also because of uh, having the muscle and the capacity to produce uh, enough doses uh, in, within Europe for to, to secure our our supply chain is important. And also the, the, the diplomatic the diplomatic one that you're mentioning and how to fight especially Russia and China in this uh, soft power battle. What should you do to ensure both these uh, soft and, and, and strong power uh, capabilities in the vaccination uh, uh, strategy in the few, few next months? It's, it's a tough question. And, and like, I mean, on, on the surface of it, I mean, it doesn't look uh, like at the moment that there's too much that the EU can do really uh, to, to, to fight back immediately against the Russian and, and Chinese vaccine diplomacy. And, and, and it's, it's unsure, like, I mean, whether it even uh, should at the moment, because I mean, like I said in the uh, introductory remarks as well, I mean, countries um, need the vaccines, obviously. Um, the, the Russian one, at least, like, has been declared safe by the, uh, the British uh, medical journal. And, and um, even if, uh, like these uh, vaccines haven't yet been authorized by Western authorities, such as the European Medical Agency, it does look like countries are, uh, I would say, understandably willing to take a chance and like, rather use the, the, the Chinese and Russian vaccines, like if the option is that they, they have to wait for months uh, for, the, for the, to get deliveries of the Western vaccines. Um, I think kind of what the EU can do and what it should do is, is uh, mainly communications related thing. I think messaging is really, really important. And it's good to see that the EU is, is, is waking up to this a little bit. Um, the EU must fight against the false narrative that it's not moving kind of fast enough or it's not doing uh, enough to vaccinate. It's not just its own citizens, but also to help uh, people in, in uh, countries around the world like where, where vaccine campaigns are not yet at the same level where they are here at the European Union. And um, I think once all vulnerable groups have been vaccinated, like within the EU itself, I, I think the Union like should give serious consideration to the Macron proposal of allocating a specific percentage of vaccines to countries, especially in this neighborhood, um, that are moving slower with the vaccination campaigns to ensure that, I mean, the image of the EU's inaction and the image of the EU's incapacity to help its partners uh, during a time of need, like such as the current one in which we live in, uh, doesn't persist. And that like the, the Russian and Chinese vaccines are not the only ones that countries um, uh, might see. In addition, I think uh, the EU must avoid like wasting uh, the va vaccines that it already has. There have been kind of some um, like troubling reports of uh, the, the vaccination campaign, like within the, the EU itself, like not moving fast enough um, so that all the vaccines that are available like could be used. And, and there might be like some uh, wastage uh, of vaccines that, that uh, could cannot be administered because um, they might have already expired. And I think this just creates a terrible image. I mean, not just within the European Union itself, but also like more broadly internationally, because I mean, there are many countries like who haven't been able to uh, yet get any of the uh, Western vaccines. And then if you have this sort of narrative going around that uh, for whatever reason, like we can't uh, administer a certain number of vaccines and they get thrown away. I think it just like creates a terrible image basically that needs to be avoided. Okay. Um... Also, uh, 
as we are having, uh, well, yesterday, European leaders met for the European Council meeting um, and discussed um, of the vaccine passport uh, initiative and, and Angela Merkel was very you know, on defending it. And we seem to have reached an agreement uh, for, this, for this summer. And even if, if it is still far away, a few months away, um, do you foresee any kind of uh, problematic uh, with this uh, passport if we don't come to an uh, homolog homologation of, uh, for example, the Russian, Chinese, and another, another non-European vaccines, for example, if, if Hungarian citizens are getting these shots? I, I, I've been reading that uh, Serbia, for example, is, is to becoming a, a touristic vaccination destiny in which Europeans can come and, and get the Russian doses if they pay for it. Then they come back to their countries, and as, as they are already vaccinated with this Russian shot, they won't get the European produced one. So, if the summer comes and we have these uh, vaccination passports, we will, we can find ourselves seeing a, a, um, a, a problematic in, in regards to, to the, the fact that some European citizens will have one kind of uh, homologated vaccine and some others wouldn't, and they won't be allowed to travel with this new system even though they're vaccinated already. What, what, what do you think we can do uh, besides, of course, speeding the homologation process? Well, I, I think kind of one thing is that uh, I think it would be great if the uh, European uh, medicines agency and, and then other Western authorities, I mean, could like also look at the Russian and the Chinese vaccines, like regardless of the political implications. And if they are safe, I mean, um, like, even though, I mean, um, like, it, 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 it might not uh, feel very, uh, very good for some um, European countries that, I mean, their citizens might get vaccinated by a Russian or Chinese vaccine at the moment. I think if a vaccine is safe, if it's authorized by uh, the, the, the European Medicines Agency or recommended for use by the European Medicines Agency, I mean, then uh, it shouldn't matter kind of what vaccine uh, you should use. But I mean, the key thing is that, I mean, there needs to be a, a central kind of authority that kind of recognizes the, the vaccines uh, that are approved and, and can be used uh, within Europe and like only the and then people can choose only like from those vaccines like whatever they want to use in order to like then uh, have a common standard that they can use to like travel perhaps and, and um, show this uh, vaccine passport that is being discussed. But I mean, with, without such approval, I mean, it, it can't be the case that if you can't get a Western manufactured vaccine um, or one of the vaccines that are approved by the European Medicines Agency, you would go to another country and then get another vaccine that it hasn't yet been approved. And, and then you could like travel freely um, within the European Union or elsewhere. I mean, I, I think that can't help but be, it's, it's really important that like we follow a, like a common process and I think follow the guidelines of the European Medicines Agency. But the problem is that I, I think so far, it, as far as I know, I mean, I'm not a, I, I don't have any claim to any medical expertise, but um, so far, I mean, based on reports I've read, I mean, it just looks like, I mean, we don't yet know sufficient, uh, sufficiently, or we don't have sufficient information about the, um, um, at least some of the Chinese vaccines. Okay, I, I agree. Uh, this this uh, could result in a very unfair and chaotic situation if, if we don't if we don't put some some uh, yeah, order and, and homogeneous system uh, within the European Union. Uh, another element that has been quite uh, uh, problematic in it, ha it seems to be solved now, but but it could it could come again with a Seneca. We had a very a very um, tough. Uh, uh, battle uh, with the UK regarding uh, the delivery of AstraZeneca doses to the European Union. And um, even the Brexit deal came into place uh, once, uh, at least from the European Commission. Um, do you foresee any, any because AstraZeneca has announced again that they, they won't be able to deliver the re-agreed um, uh, subministration um, amount um, do you foresee any more uh, pr uh, problems uh, with the UK, European uh, between the European Union and the UK regarding this? Because honestly, if if one of the main producers of our approved vaccine is the UK and we cannot secure the the income of the doses, the needed doses, at the same time, and at the same time we see that the UK has 
twice or three times more uh, percentage of the population vaccinated already, uh, this is going to create more and more, I guess, uh, controversy within EU member states. Yeah, I, I guess it um, can, and like we certainly like saw that uh, like some weeks ago. I mean, when there was a spat between the Commission and, and AstraZeneca, um, but but yeah, I mean, it's 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 a tough one, and I think the main thing that really like can be done and, and has already been done is to kind of like just enforce the contracts that have already been agreed. Um, I think the problem with some of some of the some of some of the issues is that like I mean we don't know like exactly I mean what the contracts say. I mean I think the AstraZeneca contract uh, with the European Union like was was published and if I remember correctly like it said something uh, there was a clause that said something like the company will make the best efforts that it can to deliver the agreed uh, amount of dosages. Uh, like of course I mean. I mean, that doesn't mean that there can be many things that could prevent a company from delivering the agreed upon, uh, agreed upon uh, amount of the vaccines. But in those sort of cases, I think it's important to then give like, uh, like early warning, uh, be transparent about potential kind of supply or production issues to avoid creating this sort of sense that for whatever reason, um, country A might be getting more vaccines than country B, for example. And, and uh, I, I don't think we have any interest in, in repeating the sort of spat that we saw between the Commission and, and uh, AstraZeneca in, in, uh, a few weeks ago, and that ultimately like came across as quite uh, damaging, I think, uh, for the European Union. And, and um, the, the Commission itself like got a rather large amount of like heat and criticism, not just like from the UK, uh, but also like from other member states uh, in the European Union. Let's hope so. Uh, lastly, I wanted to, to ask you, uh, because as you mentioned previously, even though uh, many people are complaining about the pace of vaccination in the European Union, many other regions in the world are in, in a worse, much worse uh, scenario right now. Are we talking about some Latin American countries, Africa, uh, Southeast Asia? Do you think at some point uh, we, could, we could encounter um, uh, security issues within uh, our neighborhood or beyond because of uh, developing countries could could uh, find themselves find themselves in in in, in legitimate uh, strong battles to 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 secure their their necess the necessary doses and do you think the european union could find themselves either either with just the the, the, the nato uh, umbrella or or just the european union uh, uh, Eurocars uh, task force to 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 deploy troops or to have to send support uh, financial aid to to any of these countries to to secure the 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 the, the, the supply of, of vaccines in in these countries. Well, well I, I think it's certainly a possibility that I mean, if if uh, there are prolonged delay delays in the vaccination process of countries in the EU's neighborhood and around the world. Um, especially in countries with with uh, very high levels of level of population, a very de very dense uh, population, I, I think there's certainly a chance that I mean uh, a lack of uh, vaccines or a slow moving vaccination process could increase tensions like within those countries that like might could uh, boil over in the worst case. I mean, it's important to remember that I mean people throughout history have kind of started like uh, revolting and 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 uh, expressing dissatisfaction. I mean, for much kind of lesser sounding uh, reasons. I mean, like the shortages of like bread in Russia, for example. I mean, were like caused significant dissatisfaction like during the late Tsar's period as well. So I mean, it's 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 not kind of far fetched to think that I mean if in countries in the EU's own neighborhood. Uh, there's not enough vaccine. People feel dissatisfied. Um, people feel that, I mean, the European Union or the United States are grabbing the lion's share of the vaccines, that this would, this, that dissatisfaction like would then like lead into political unrest as well. Um, like should the European Union like then deploy some kind of operation? It's hard to say and depends of course on the, on, on the spe specific situation at hand. 
but probably, I mean, the worst priority, I mean, the, the first priority is to provide kind of civilian assistance, uh, provide aid uh, to these countries to make it visible, to make it look visible that the European Union is, is doing something as it is. And, and um, basically like just uh, pre pre prevent and preempt uh, the, the, any, any sort of kind of uh, mass frustration in, in, in the regions around the European Union that could then like lead to further instability. I think that's basically uh, it. Okay, uh, well, uh, we'll we'll see in a few months. Uh, either way, I think uh, for the next episodes, you and I will be discussing many, many topics until we can have our first shot uh, because we are young and healthy. So I don't, I don't foresee uh, a, a quick vaccination for the, the two of us. So we can discuss this uh, for a long time <laughs> and still like it. Uh, probably, so yeah. You. Probably, yeah. And we have to see like which vaccine like we'll also get. Uh, It'll be interesting to see, uh, like which which one uh, we'll end up get, getting and which and and and, uh, and when, uh, like you said. But uh, hopefully, sometime this year. But like you said, I mean, we're in a good position that, like, I mean, we're in the age group that doesn't make us uh, vulnerable, and we're also healthy. So I mean, uh, it's not too bad at the moment. Totally. Well, thank you once again, Nicholas, and have a good weekend. Likewise, and thanks a lot to everybody again, like for uh, joining joining us and um, listening to the podcast and and uh, we'll be uh, back again soon hopefully uh, to discuss another interesting uh, topical issue uh, that has uh, uh, that affects uh, the european union security defense and uh, foreign policy and today uh, we focused on uh, vaccine diplomacy um, in the coming weeks uh, we'll see like what other topics we can cook up for you so thanks a lot and have a good day wherever you are Cheers. That was today's episode of Defense Dialogue. Subscribe to our podcasts for more.